Gig Gab, the show for working musicians for Monday, March 9th, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and as I said, about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. Paul, I have so many things. We, I had a gig this weekend I want to tell you about. I know you had some gigs this weekend you want to tell yeah. us about, but we can't do that today. And the reason we can't do that today is that my microphone's on the wrong side. And the reason my microphone's on the wrong side is that we are uh, ecstatic. I am ecstatic to welcome... Mike Dias, longtime in-ear monitor champion, artist relations, marketing, sales, and probably other things at Ultimate Ears for a while. Now with the in-ear monitor international trade organization, Mike, and a good friend. Mike, thank you for coming on the show. Are you kidding Welcome, me, Mike. guys? Thank you so much. It's an honor. That's awesome to have you, man. This is it's it's good timing. Uh, for years, actually, I've been thinking about we need to get you on the show, and so uh, so here we are. Here we are. So thanks for coming, man. Yeah. It, the time is perfect. I was listening to the episode of when you were watching Trey fiddle with his ears. And once we started talking about that, it's it's great timing to talk about in-ears in general. In, in general. History. Yeah. So we'll probably dig through the history a little bit, but let's let's start with the present. Tell me, tell us, tell everybody what, because the In-Ear Monitor International Trade Organization, do we call that I-E-M-I-T-O? Yeah. Is that okay I, to call I, it? IEMITO for short. It I, rolls off the tongue. I say that again? IEMITO. IEMITO. I like this. This is good. It's a good so, brand name. It is a good brand name. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so tell us, like that. this organization is officially less than a year old, but not I mean, in reality, I think it's been building for a while. So tell us a little bit about the genesis of how we got here today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for opening that up. It's probably better to start with me and my history before we get into the, okay. the, the in-ears. So I am not a musician and I'm not an engineer, which means I snuck into this industry through the side door. Right. <laughs> but you've been in this just so everybody knows. I mean, I, I know I just said it, but you've been in this industry for, you know, well over a decade, if not if not two. So yeah. true, true. Almost yeah. two decades. So yeah. it's, uh, all my friends are musicians and engineers. Let's put it that way. There you go. So I was introduced to Mindy and Jerry through a mutual friend uh, 20 years ago when they were still running Ultimate Ears out of the back of a tour bus. Mindy and Jerry Harvey, just for people. And Jerry was a guest on, on Gig Gab a couple years ago. We'll put a link in the show notes there for, for folks that want to hear that. So, yeah. Thanks. And we hit it off. One thing led to another. I started doing a lot of ghostwriting for Jerry in the technical trades. And this was early in the in the in-ear development, right? I mean, just think about this. I don't even think in-ears had a, had a proper brand name. I think they were still called... Uh, Personal monitors, maybe yeah, it was personal monitors. I think right? I think so. Yeah, and and if you well, there are folks that wish we still used that term, but but we don't. It's like Kleenex now and FedEx. It we call them in ear monitors because that's every, what everybody knows them as. Yep, that's Thank right. You. You're welcome. And, and so <laughs> <laughs> and and so again to put this time in perspective, there was just a handful of companies making in ears for pro musicians. Nobody was doing it for the the music uh, lovers, the audiophiles, the hobbyists. And it was a few years before the launch of the iPod, right? Right. So I was that guy who had a compact PC it, it, with with the sand disk cards with my music loaded onto it. And when I met Mindy and Jerry and I saw in-ears, I got a glimpse of what could be coming with the portable audio revolution. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I need to detour us because my, my entry point into this was because of my tech side being, you know, at Mac Observer and, and doing all the stuff that we do there. 
And so it was the UE5C, yep. which was targeted towards the music listener, not the music performer. Yep. That was sort of the, my entry point here. And it sounds like you may have, you, you and I may have, have been kindred spirits long before we met. So. Yes. And, and that UE5C was a few years in the making, right? Before Got it. Before there was that, there was just the five and there was nothing about consumers, right? Got it. As musicians would use these as a tool, they'd also use them to listen. The legend has it that uh, one of the members of Lincoln Park pulls Jerry aside and says, "Hey, there's this new thing called an iPod. You gotta, you gotta listen with your ears. It's mind blowing." That's amazing. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. And so, so the five C starts to introduce around that time. And there was a there was a forum about that time. It's called HeadFi.org. And around then, there's maybe I don't know ten thousand monthly subs- uh, viewers, unique viewers. Yep, it's three million right now. Okay, yeah, right? it's so not surprising. So try to put that into perspective. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that's 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 me and how I came to this. The only thing. That, that, that I'm passionate about. It, sorry, that's not true. They're not the only thing I'm passionate about. But, but <laughs> I, I figured, I figured, yeah, I figured yeah, maybe the main yeah, thing. Yeah, the main thing I'm passionate about is where where music, art, technology, science, and business overlap. And for me, that's that's in ears embodied. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. No. And 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 you're. I mean, you're not alone. That's again. That's how I came into this too. It's and I also happen to be a musician, as listeners to this show certainly know. Yep. Uh, but that but that's yeah. Interesting. Fascinating. Okay. Were you using a universal when you were gigging before the five C? No. So I've I, to say that I've never gigged with universal fits is not true. But I started my in ears with custom fits. Yeah, okay. Because of this other entry point here. So it was right as the UE5C came out, I got in touch with Jerry Harvey um, because of that. And then he's like, well, you know, there, there's other paths here, you know. And, and so that that opened the door for me. I always wear earplugs, though. So, I, you know, we talked about transitions a couple of episodes ago. Uh, my transition was not simple, but it, I think was way easier because I was already used to the level of sort of detachment that earplugs provide from you know from the your surroundings and so at least i didn't have to deal with that so what was it like the first time you plugged your your five c's in oh it was amazing well they didn't fit right the first time but that's okay they you know they they (laughs) fixed that and that's pretty typical although i will say that um ultimate ears new uh laser uh, what are they using now is it uh, it, it's, it's some sort additive of additive 3D process, 3D scanning that yeah. does it, instead of having your ears, the, the traditional way of getting in ears done is to get uh, molds done at an audiologist. And now uh, Ultimate Ears has been using slash experimenting with this 3D imaging that can be done by a non audiologist, a well-trained but non audiologist person. And I will say that every set of in ears I've ever gotten has never fit the first time. It's mm. always, you know, a back and forth and it's fine. I mean, it, you were talking millimeters make a difference here. So, uh, you know, something happens with the mold or, you know, it's just not quite right. Whatever it is. The only set that's ever fit the first time is the one that was done with the 3D imaging. So it feels like that might be a good I mean, you know, I'm a sample size of one. So maybe it doesn't matter. But but certainly from my standpoint, it's like, oh, well, we've we've moved the you know, we've moved down the path a little bit. So, yeah. So, Mike, what is the purpose of, of the organization? And do you have, you know, what kind of buy-in do you have from the manufacturers? And what do you do on behalf of them? I mean, they're all competitive and, you know, they're really very f- fine points about how they uh, stake out their distinctions and their unique selling points. So wh- how do you guys help that? And, you know, what is the charter of the organization and how do you represent your members? Thanks for asking. So you're right it was not easy to get everybody in the room and agree to be part of a larger organization for the greater good of the consumer and for the industry but everybody knew that it's necessary when i started there were you know a handful of companies and now there's over 250 manufacturers worldwide this is changing wow. right and it's continuing on this way. And by the way, there's a global headphone revolution that's happening and true wireless. We can, we can, we can touch on this in a bit. But 
the mission of the organization is to promote the use and benefits of in-ear monitors. And by doing that, by all working together to, to talk about how in-ears help you perform your best, benefits everybody. So you want to think of the organization as a marketing arm on behalf of the industry. Okay. Advocacy. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Drink milk. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. We, we don't care what brand you drink. I like it. There you go. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then there's, there's another component to it that I believe that what's happening on stage with working musicians and with the top touring musicians is that they're the epicenter of this global headphone revolution. The, the demands that they're making, the fidelity, the, the quality, the, the personalization, the, the robustness, we're able to work this out as an industry on stage, and then we're able to take that and put it into a general consumer headphone for everybody else. It's like Formula One or e-racing, whatever, you, whatever analogy you want to go with, what's happening on stage is translating out to the wider space of headphones. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because this is where the pros are using it, so y you can afford to do sort of the more expensive experimental stuff that you don't have to do at scale uh, in order to test it out in the consumer world and then find what works and bring it down. Yeah, I would argue that true wireless would not be possible if it were not for the advent of the in-ears. I mean, if you're looking, if we want to get technical and talk about the balanced armatures and... That's a very interesting thing. I hadn't thought about that, but... You're right. Yeah. Balanced armatures, and they didn't start here, but, but they started for consumers here. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, if we could get true wireless with our onstage in-ears, that'd be awesome. But, but there is some the physics gets in the way of that sometimes with, uh, with latency. Yeah. So. We're not there yet. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey, Paul, how did, how did you start using in-ears? Um, my good friend, Dave, you know, really advocated for the experience that he has. And I don't know if Dave has told you, but I'm like the worst case study for this because 10 years and I'm still not a hundred percent on in-ears because I'm never comfortable. If I was to say one out of 10 or 15 or 20 gigs would be good. Two or three out of 15 or 20 gigs would be, I can get by. And a lot of times I'm put in a situation where we're, I play in a big band that's pretty loud. I play in a 10 piece band, horns. Often when we're on a really small cramped stage, it's pretty loud on stage. And so, and I, and there's some places where I don't even have the option of having a wedge. And so sometimes I, I get it. I use an in-ear just as a necessity. And, and I'm kind of down to the point now where I'm so fussy about the mix that goes in there. And it really throws me off if it's not right or, or it changes as time goes on that I'll just take I'll just take my vocals so I can hear them and not have to push so bad. But um, yeah, I'm I'm the poster child for the problem guy uh, of of in ears. I, I'd flip that. I'd say you're the poster child for in ears and what they should be and how they're supposed to serve. Right? You're Bless you're him. not you're not alone <laughs> in this one. No. No, and well, and well, and again, Dave's been my psychologist on this all the time, and you know he believes there's a path to success there. And it's funny in my ten piece band. Um, five, six, seven of the guys are using in-ears. All the horns, I have five-piece horn section. They all took to in-ears really naturally. I don't know how what they mix for themselves, you know, but they're very happy and they took to it immediately. My fellow guitar player has taken to it very naturally and he doesn't have fitted. He has universal and um, he's really happy. You know, he gets what he wants. The drummer, our drummer uses them often. Um, and is happy when he's happy. In some cases, he just chooses not to. But myself, lead guitar and, and front guy and singer, my keyboard player, singer, and my bass player do not use them. Um, for all for different reasons. I desperately want to use them because I really want to save my voice. And I really want, you know, I when, when it's been great, you get a kind of a glimpse into this, you know, nirvana <laughs> society that you can be a part of. But it's just, I'm so sensitive that as, a gig goes on and someone turns up and as soon as the mix is wrong for me, I can't deal with it. And as soon as, as soon as I take them out and kind of feel the energy from the stage, that kind of drives the live performance and then I can't go back in. And so, the, you know, I have a kind of a few moving targets as to why I haven't been able to, but I really want to be able to use them. Yeah. That, uh, that, well, that, that, I, I mean, I, as a, as a musician, I totally 
like your comment about the, the the way it feels without them in on stage, like totally resonates with me. But I I I am not a heroin addict, um, and I don't ever want to be. But y- <laughs> you know, because I know it's bad for me. But I I've also heard it feels really good. You know, and so like part of me doesn't allow myself to do that as much. I I even even like I could point to gigs in the last year where it's been like, oh, I took one out because. It just sounded so much better. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. It can sound great with the ears in. You just have to have the control over your mix is really, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. That's- well, again, I'm, I'm fronting the band and I rarely have time to futz with my, yep. with my mix as I'm going along. And it's, you know, once you kind of get into the flow of the show, it's hard to keep calling the sound guy up or, you know, sending hand signals to the guy, you know, all these types of things. So wait, wait, he can't you read know, your mind. Yeah, you know, we, if you could add that into the next version, that'd be really great. Does so. he wear, does your, I mean, and I realize, you know, we don't all have the benefit of having a dedicated monitor engineer per person or even for the band. Most of the time it's, you know, if you even have someone helping you with your sound, they're doing everything, including front of house. But uh, I do know some folks that their monitor engineer also wears in ears and can switch between mixes. So when you say when, you know, when you give him that look like something is wrong, well, he could switch to your mix and, oh, okay, maybe he's. Yeah, Bill does do that. And he'll 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 put on uh, he'll put on cans, not in ears. And um, and I don't know how much of a different experience it is. I've really come to the conclusion because everybody else seems to be cool with it, that I am just so hypersensitive Mm -hmm. to the changes in the mix. And I don't know whether that psychologically sends a message that, oh, crap. We're, everything's going downhill, take him out and, you know, get control of your show again or what the deal is. But like I said, as over the course of a night, my band gets louder, different guys in different ways. We're often a 10 piece band on a really small stage. And, you know, it, there's just interesting bleeds that happen from all over the place into my vocal mic. And it's just, I find it hard to get that relaxed place. The, the one or two times that I've had perfect experiences with in ears have been pretty large stages where there's a lot of separation. Interesting. What uh, what ambient ports do you have in your ears? I have the sevens. So uh, whatever those ports are, UE sevens. And they and they are the ambient the seven ambients, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And and they have an on off as in you're not switching out filters. It's either open or. That's correct. I've had the sevens before too, and it's yeah, yeah. it's you, you can either plug the ambient port or not plug yeah. the ambient port. That's yeah, right. So that's yep. giving you about a seven uh, a twelve dB right in there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Mm. But again, you know, Dave thinks I can get over it. We have another friend who's a, you know, a pro mixer who has a different approach to, you know, getting people comfortable. But man, you know, the one time you get a glimpse into paradise, it's like, oh, you know, it could be like this. And then the next time when it, you kind of go back to being frustrated with it. It's I wonder, just, you uh, know, you, you, your comment, and, and I realize we're sort of derailed here, but you know, this is what happens on gig gab. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your comment about your vocal mic is interesting. Uh, I, and, and the, your, your thought that the stage getting louder and then bleeding into your vocal mic makes a lot of sense. I wonder if you, maybe considering changing your vocal mic to something that has a much tighter pattern. Mm. Like, you, you know, I, I know the, um, the, the Telefunken M80 or M81, M8X series, you know, and there's a lot of different mics in there with different uh, EQ patterns, but they're all very tight patterned mics and are great on stages that are prone to feedback with monitor wedges for exactly the same reason that they, they don't pick up a lot of off axis stuff. I wonder well, if I used a 50 beta 58. And so, you know, and I'm totally open to trying other things. And actually before I kind of, you know, take over this whole show with my problem, <laughs> Mike, if you, you have, you know, a, a guy in the Bay Area who you think might be of help for me in terms of getting a foundational base mix that I might be able to work off of. I'm totally open to it. I've got a great sound guy. He's totally open to help. He's a little bit scratching his head as to why why I'm so sensitive to these things. So if there's an approach to dealing with that sensitivity, I'd love to do it and then come back and report on, you know, the path to Nirvana. His game but, on. Um, 
Came yeah. on. Challenge you, accepted. Cha- yeah. Bring it on, man. There you go. I, I will be your greatest success story. <laughs> there, there, there's a couple companies doing some interesting innovations with the, the ambient ports right now, purposely designing for ambient always being on. And I think that's we'll probably start with that. Interesting. All right. Well, I want to I want to hear just some of the examples of that, just so we're not leaving it nebulous for our our listeners. But first, I want to talk about our sponsor for this episode, which is also gear related, Uh, different kind of gear. So perfect fit is Chauvet DJ at ChauvetDJ.com. That's C-H-A-U-V-E-T DJ dot com. And these folks, we've been using Chauvet DJ stuff and fling since before this podcast started. So certainly before the sponsorship ever was even on the table. But their new gig bar move is awesome. Powerful, affordable, lightweight, and ultra convenient. It's got moving head fixtures, wash light pairs, strobes, and lasers all on one bar so that you set up and tear down in minutes without taking a lot of time and, you know, transportation space and all that stuff. They get that we're gigging musicians and that we need to be able to set this stuff up quickly and not with a lot of fanfare. Just the fanfare is once it's up, not getting it all set up. So you got to check this out. This this gig bar move. Uh, not only is there that, but you can control it with their BT Air app with your tablet or your phone. So you can really configure this thing the way you want. Go check it out. ChauvetDJ.com. Again, that's C H A U V E T D J dot com. And uh, I know it's DJ, but they, they, they make the stuff that we working musicians want too. It makes sense. Trust me on this. It's what, like I said, we've been using their stuff in fling for years. It's, it's awesome. So go check it out. And our thanks to Chauvet DJ uh, for sponsoring this episode. All right. So tell us about a little bit of that gear, because this ambient stuff, I, I've always been a fan. And I know there are like if you want to find camps in the in-ear world, and these are my words, not anyone else's, certainly not Mike's. Uh, but if you want to find camps in the in-ear world, mention ambient and you can draw a line down the middle of the room. There are some people that believe that we shouldn't ever use ambient stuff. There are some people that believe it is the path to Nirvana. I am most definitely on the on the on the camp that, that for me. It works, you know, the, the ambient stuff worked really well. There are gigs where I don't use it, but but I believe it is a great uh, tool in the arsenal of getting in-ears to work for many folks. So, yeah, uh, yeah. This, is, this is a hot topic. It's a hot topic. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we've entered murky waters. We have, here, <laughs> I know. I just wanted to acknowledge that because I know we've got folks listening that probably, you know, cringe anytime, even just the, the concept of ambient. And by ambient, what we mean is, Letting some of the stage wash sound in, you know, you, you talked about the the UE seven ambience the, uh, that that you wear, Paul, and and that's a what I'll call a, a passive uh, ambient structure where you're literally changing. You, you know, if you think of in ears starting as an earplug that blocks out everything and then has a speaker inside it, right? I mean, that's sort of a very reductive way of thinking about what in-ear monitors are. Uh, Ambient, in this case, the passive ambient means that they are slightly less of an earplug. They block maybe 12 to 15 dB instead of 25 to 30 dB. And and there's a little port that, that allows you to change how much of that ambient sound is being allowed in just passively on the stage. So so th- starting the conversation there just to give people that, that haven't experienced this some, some foundation. I'm curious what else is now coming up in the market. So. Yeah. Thanks for setting that stage. Sure. So again, if we're going to draw a big picture, the umbrella, the, the concept of in-ears is you want to use them blocking everything out. You want to get that studio sound, that studio control. Totally. But Paul, just like you said, you lose some of that live feeling, which leads to you, Dave, pulling one out, which is right. which is the big no no. That's saying the, that that's the, the no no. That's right. the no no, right? Right. And worse than that, Paul, it leads to a situation where you're not using them and you're not getting any benefit. And so that's that's the real point of this conversation and why I'm grateful that you had me on here. I'm here to say and to advocate for the entire industry that in-ears help you take your game to another level, right? Anybody who's spending money on their gear, anybody who's investing in themselves, who's out working, playing, having fun with it, you could buy more more mics, you can buy more anything, but really you want to get and invest in a personal ear system, a 
personal monitoring system because it lets you practice a different way. It lets you perform a different way. The focus, the clarity, the detail that it gives you really lets you go into your craft, into your hobby, into your profession on another level, right? Makes sense, yeah. Not having that experience or being blocked from it for any way, like what, what's happening to you, Paul, is, is eliminating this. And so it is better to move on the continuum than to do nothing whatsoever. And, and that's that's the point of the in your organization is to have conversations like this. Any listener right now who has a question about in ears, email Dave anytime. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah. or, that's or, or, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Yeah, yeah. That's or, right. Or or you can log onto the in your organization and just send me a note and I, I send them right over to all the, the the actual manufacturers that you're looking to talk to. That's that's another huge part of the Got in it. Okay. Right? Yeah. We answer your questions and we connect the dots. It's it's a platform that connects you with the manufacturers, with the sound engineer, anything you need in your related. So the, these these therapy sessions. How do you use your in ear? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Are, are what we want to have, right? So getting back to this concept of ambient right now, it was uh, from a manufacturer standpoint, the, you need it, but we're not really thinking about it, and we just stick a tube in it. And that's ambient. Sure. Now, there's a company out of Europe called Dynamic Ear uh, Company, DEC. Okay. And they, they have these purpose-built filters that are different than the etymotic musician filters. And some of these filters have now found their way into in-ears that have been designed around the filter itself. Uh, in-ears are funny because all the low-end re uh, resonance that you're getting comes from bone conductivity. And so one of the big problems with an ill-fitting in-ear you have a lot of high and you're very tinny and you have no boominess. Right. right? And if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a good fitting in ear, any one of you can test this by cracking it open a little bit and you're missing something. And so there's, there's a fine line with opening with ambient. How do you open and still maintain it's low and seal. resonance? Yeah, right. Yeah. It, you lose your seal by you, it, you, right? By definition, you lose your seal, right? right? So how do you design a sound signature around something that can be closed and open and you're going to change the dynamics there? And so they're now purpose-built in-ears. Westone's doing a series. ACS does a series. Got there, it. There's a few others. And, and these, are, these start with a filter and the sound signature is designed around it. That makes sense. Okay, so still a passive s system mm -hmm. in that the, the sound that's coming in is just coming in from around you by, by its own energy, uh, but, but built around that, that filter so that we're not uh, we're not just the filter's not the afterthought. The filter is the foundation of this. Correct. Got it. Now there's other companies who are taking a different take and designing active ambient systems. Uh, Sensophonics has been a pioneer yeah. with that. Sensophonics had one ten plus years ago or something, right? Yep. I yep. Mean, and yeah. they've been able to take the entire system now and put it into a phone app. And so this is a revolution oh, for for concert musicians, for classical musicians. They're now able to use in ears. They can boost frequencies, if you will. Like, let's say on my left ear, I'm low at a, at a certain bandwidth. I can boost that, but I can also change my ambient bleed depending on what or who's around me. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this. This is kind of the. This is one of the frontiers of in ears right now. Of how to do, do ambience. Now, if we think about the what we were talking about earlier, with this is the center of technology. I'm walking down the street wearing an in-ear and boom, I get hit by a car. It's a problem, right? Because That's bad. Because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm fully sealed up. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so as we move into true wireless, this is one of the situations that you need to have. How do you get fidelity, but how do you have spatial awareness? And right now everyone's doing this with active noise cancellation, a mic coming in, but it doesn't sound natural. Right. Ambient is much more relevant than just working musicians. Even though we're talking about a subset of a subset of a subset, we're actually talking about solving true wireless for everybody right now. Sure. Uh, well, and I mean, y you know, Apple, I mean, Apple has made it popular with their AirPods. They are certainly not the first. Apple's rarely the first to do anything. They just tend to do it well and market it extremely well. Uh, but but with the AirPods Pro and they've got the the, the transparency mode or whatever mm -hmm. they call that, where it's they're letting some of that sound in 
even though it's sealed in your ear, or supposedly sealed in your ear. But yeah, yep. and so that's an active system, right? yeah, and this passive system, and so it gets really interesting how this goes, right? Because an active system using a microphone uh, is is now you get to control. It's not just is the port open or plugged. The microphone's always there. You just get to mix it as though it were another element of your of your overall mix, right? But the mics are on your person. And not separated from you. So you don't like the weird part. And I've used, especially when I started off, and I find this is true of most people that that need this, is you start with an ambient mic. You know, for me, it was easy because I've got mics on overhead my drums. So they're, you know, fixed position. But so am I as a drummer. <laughs> right. Uh, and using those you bleeding more of that in to get that stage wash can really help. But it is a disconnected thing because the mic is not where I am, I am seated. It's, you know, for me, it's above me, but for a guitar player, it could be even further away. And as you move around the stage, the mic does not move with you. So you have this fixed in space, ambient picture with, with a detached ambient mic with what like Sensophonic uh, was doing or, and, and perhaps others, the mic is on your person and sometimes right in the earpiece itself. Right. So yeah. that it's really where you're expecting to hear from. Then there's another level, right? We, we haven't talked about this, but in-ears are just half the equation. You've got to talk about what you're plugging them into, right? And right. so now there's a lot of these personal monitor mixers who are also putting a mic right into the mixer. So you can be on stage, you can have a mic in your mix, and you can adjust it right there. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Makes sense. Of course. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Anybody done any work to kind of compare the different approaches to getting ambient to, uh, captured, whether it's better to just put, you know, mics on the side of the stage or use these on stage ambient mixers? Is there any is that something that you guys would do in order to kind of come up with a guidebook for for uh, or case studies for uh, potential users? Oh, you just threw me in the hot zone. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's something we'll be working on. But this is this is. Uh, let's call it everybody's recipe. Everybody has a take on what sure. to do and how to do it. Got it. Yeah. Right? The ideal situation, once you get comfortable with in-ears, is to perform with them sealed in, in your your studio environment on stage. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still not there, <laughs> to be fair. But, but you, you know, I, I still, I don't use ambient mics anymore, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do use, uh, but I do leave the ports open on my UE 11s. Yeah. So, um, it, it, you know, what I, one problem I have is it, because I'm a drummer, I, I, I need to hear my drums Right. I'm used to playing the drums and hearing them. So if I've sealed my ears off and I don't hear them, I will play louder. I always joke, but it's true. I tell every sound engineer, look, I'll control my own mix. That's fine. You don't have to worry about it. But if I start playing too loudly, give me more snare drum. I will naturally play quieter, like self-preservation kicks right in. It's no problem. But the reverse is, is very much true. So if I'm not using the ambient ports, then I need more overhead. And now I'm actually getting more stage wash into that overhead, usually if it's a smaller stage. And so it's, it's this balance of I, I got to find I need to be able to hear what I'm playing. And now, OK, and if I'm close miking everything, that's different. But a lot of times for gigs, it's kick snare overhead kind of thing. And, and you're off to the races. And so, yeah. What's your take on tactile feedback? Like the uh, butt Haptic. kickers. Oh, a butt yeah, kicker. The haptic. I mean, butt, butt kicker is the yeah. generic brand of this. But Avium's in the mix now. There's plenty of other people doing this. You know, I've never been comfortable. I, I grew up without any monitors whatsoever mm -hmm. right you know this is in my I, I always joke that my kids are super spoiled because they had oh yeah anyway uh, it's true because it's true it's not a joke uh but yeah i you know i was lucky my brother had my brother was a guitar player in our band and he had this old gorilla amp you know the the, the tiny little maybe it's got a six inch speaker in it or something i started bringing that to gigs and feeding myself a, a, a monitor sensor i could hear vocals i was i was one of the harmony singers in the band and i still didn't have a monitor it was just like whatever was in front of the drums so 
I, the first gigs when we started playing and they wanted to give me kick drum in my monitor. They're like, how much kick do you want? I'm like, zero. What do you, what kind of question is that? Why would I need, the, the drum is right here. What are you talking about? And then finally, of course, I experienced what most drummers have gotten used to where you hit your kick drum and this speaker next to you just like explodes with all this low end. Like that is terrible. I hate that. So I really don't, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to ask about butt kickers because you know, you, 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 we were talking before the show, you get your sonic home and, and that's what's comfortable to you. And, and, and this is, I mean, we were talking about it before the show in as a topic, but it really is the topic of the whole show. It's what's your sonic home for you, Paul, you know, you're trying to approximate this thing that that you are comfortable with and i'm doing the same thing right so yeah butt kicker yeah. and me are not um we're not friends <laughs> but it's not it's it's not i have nothing against the product i think it actually makes a lot of sense for people that are used to that um but uh but it's just i don't need it i don't want it i'm glad you brought up the concept of sonic home because i think that that that's that disencapsulates it sorry encapsulates the the whole program right right that little six inch gorilla amp speaker, that's your sonic home. That's the sound that resonates so with you. <laughs> it, but, but it's not, it's all of us in their garage. Yeah. When, I, when I said I wasn't a musician, I mean, it didn't mean that I didn't play in my garage. I was, Got a, it. I was a lousy musician. Oh, okay. Right? Well, welcome to the club then. <laughs> <laughs> I've never made, I've made money not playing, but. <laughs> but, uh, that that sound of playing in your garage with your friends and and lousy amps and lousy gear yeah that's what we all have in our head and it's funny because th we have access to so much phenomenal high fidelity gear but we have to train ourselves to get used to that totally no that's exactly it i'm lucky in that i am a geek and and like to live on the bleeding edge and I like to have all the latest gadgets and toys. So in addition to like you, Paul, having the desire to simply use in ears because it protects my hearing and all of those, you know, sort of foundational things. I also just like to use the latest gear. And so I, I liked being the guy that showed up at a gig 15 years ago with in-ears, you know, because everybody was like, what, who are you? Like, why do you have like, who, what do you, who do you think you are? It wasn't who are you? It was who do you think you are? That, that was the question. Uh, and and uh, but, you know, it was just like, that's me. And I'd like to have all this stuff. That's why I started a podcast 15 years ago. Right. So um, it, it, but. It that adjustment you have to you know Paul when you said earlier you want to get there like that's the key or if you're young and just starting out or if you are a parent of someone who is just starting out get them on in ears out of the gate so they never learn anything else and their sonic home now will be that and it's and then there's no adjustment you're just good to go I, I will say I had to play a gig uh, three or four months ago where I chose not to be that guy that asked for an in-ear mix. I, I could have, I know the engineer is a dear friend. It would have been super easy, but we, you know, we were playing a 35 minute set with four other bands. I understand what the engineer is going through in this world. And it was like, I can make his life easier and just not be that guy. I had forgotten how noisy and washy and awful it sounds on stage. It was a, I mean, the gig was great. I had fun gig, but it was awful. I hated the way it sounded. It was it, like, I couldn't hear anything. So I, I have the opposite problem of you, Paul, evidently. Uh, yeah, evidently. Evidently. <laughs> Paul, we just got to find your sonic home where we got to recreate you, you singing in the shower on stage. <laughs> Can you wear clothes though? <laughs> it's really best for everybody involved if we don't go there. It is. It is. <laughs> Well, this is awesome. I feel like we could talk for for hours um, and we probably will. But is there anything else topically that uh, that that you have in mind that you want to share here before we uh, before we tell people where to find you and all that good stuff? No, I, I want to thank you both for what you're doing. You've been doing this for 15 years. No, no. This shows five years. No, Actually, but happy anniversary, Paul. Like uh, just two weeks That's ago, right. we hit our, our fifth year of, of Gig Gab. But you, yeah, you've been doing this for five years, but you've been doing podcasts since they came out. I yeah. mean, think about that for a second. Yeah, what a revolution crazy. of time and space. It's right? It's been crazy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for always being a supporter and a passionate endorser of in-ears uh, for man. musicians, for hobbyists. And 
thank you everybody who listened and and who wants to be part of this movement too. We're we're all here for questions and this this is your future, your ears, your craft, and it's worth investing in. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. Paul, do you have any other questions before we uh, before we let Mike go here? I don't have any other questions. I just think it's great. You know, it, it does make entire sense. Like it's just this paradigm shift will allow musicians to play longer into their life without hearing loss. I know in those few moments when I have been really comfortable, my ability to emote vocally has been so much better when I can hear the nuance, you know, as opposed to just kind of like this, this blare coming from a wedge in front of me, just the ability to express even more. There's so much upside. And like I said, hopefully, all right, Mike, I'm going to, we'll connect after. And like I said, I will be your poster child for opportunity and success here because I really, really, really would like to get there and, uh, and achieve that, that sonic nirvana. We'll get you there, man. We're, we, you've got a lot of people committed to this. So, yeah. <laughs> it takes a village, my friend. The, the team is yeah. strong. That's right. Yep. A, a yep. special thanks to all the IAMIDO members for allowing me to do this. And yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, man. And, and awesome. so, so if people want to find IAMIDO, where do they go for this? Inearmonitor.org. Inearmonitor.org. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, awesome to see you again. Awesome to have you on the show. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, and, uh, we're good, right, Paul? We're good. We're good, man. We're good. All right. Oh, what is, what I is have one last thing to say. What is that? Always be purelling your microphone. <laughs> that is good advice, my friend. That's In always been good advice. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, you want to be able to keep performing. That's the key. <laughs> See you next week, folks. <laughs> <laughs>